right. Sounds good. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of Controllers Up, Cards Down, the All-Star Gaming Podcast. I am one third of your hosting team this evening, Mr. Scott Crawford, coming to you from Swartz Creek, Michigan. And with me, as always, Heather Powell coming to you today from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. And we have the biggest name in podcasting here with us today. You may know him from Fresh Cuts, No More Room in Hell, In the Mic of Madness, also formerly on the Rotten Round Table. Also, he's on this really great show called It's Not Horror, Okay? <laughs> he is the one, the only, Mr. Venom. Mr. Venom, thank you so much for being here. Greetings and salutations, gamers. Y'all, thank you very much for having me, guys. This is great. This is a new experience for me. I haven't done any kind of gaming shows, so this should be fun. Well, we knew we had to have you on because of your history, A, with video games and card games. Yeah, I mean, I I consider myself very lucky that I've lived through every generation of video games. I'm at that exact perfect age where I was six years old when the very first uh, video game, the true video game console came out. And I've owned every major console all the way through all nine generations, including now, which uh, with my PS5, my Xbox Series X. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a corporate whore. Hey, nice. we're all corporate whores in one way or another, are we not? <laughs> so, so we would love to hear, you've already kind of shared a little bit with us, but do you mind just walking us through your history? Like maybe talking more about your first game system, your favorite kind of games, and then mm-hmm. other types of games you play, just not mind games, Venom. We don't want to talk about that on this podcast. I experienced enough I, of those I'm in my married. real life. <laughs> yeah, I'm married. I'm not allowed to play those anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, where to start? Obviously, right from the beginning, I, I believe it was 1976, 1977 that I, we, my father and I, we bought our first video game console, which was the, the, the Coleco Telstar which was really just glorified Pong. If you guys remember Pong, oh, yeah. it was just yeah. uh, the Coleco Telstar, I believe came with four preloaded games, but they were all just variations of Pong. One was called table tennis. One was called handball. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember what else, but they were all basically Pong. Um, and then from there, it just started a love affair. I mean, I remember the very first day my father and I bought that first console. We played it all night, much to my mother's chagrin. <laughs> um, to the point where we actually broke the television because at the time, oh, wow. obviously, this is 1976-77, so we had those big console TVs, and yeah. apparently those things were not meant to handle video game graphics. So yeah, in about I'd say two weeks after getting our Coleco Telstar, we destroyed the television, and uh, yeah, ended up having to get a new one. Which blah 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 blah. Just like I said, it just started my obsession with gaming. Um, and then from there, it just, it's never subsided, you know, from Atari 2600, Atari 5400, uh, you know, on and on and on. I mean, I, I can count, I could probably count on one hand the consoles released in North America that I have not owned. I mean, oh, wow. I lived, when I first went to college in, um, in Pittsburgh in 1994, I lived with gamers and we all had a different console. Um, I had a, I had an Atari Jaguar. Somebody had a Panasonic 3DO. Nice. Somebody had, you know, obviously we had like a PlayStation and, you know, your, your basic one, Sega CD, stuff like that. And then collectively we put our money together. We put together, I believe almost $1,100 and bought a Neo Geo arcade machine one of those big arcade machines that has like 30 or something games on it. And we really only bought it for Samurai Showdown. We just all <laughs> nice. wanted, we loved Samurai Showdown and we spent over a grand to get an arcade machine to play the one. So yeah, we, like I said, I associate with uh, other obsessives like myself. So um, <laughs> that's awesome. As far as favorites, I mean, my all time favorite game is it will always be Super Metroid. Nothing will ever change that. I adore that game. I play it on every generation, pretty much every generation since the Super Nintendo. Nintendo will put out like a digital version of it that you can download. And I've, even though it's the exact same game, no HD updates, no changes. It's still just, I, I've probably beaten it on a good 10 to 12 consoles at this point. Absolutely oh, nice. my favorite game. Just adore it. Um, as far as modern stuff, I mean, Resident Evil is probably easily my favorite franchise. So you probably know what game I'm going to want to talk about later. 
<laughs> oh yeah. Nice. Um, and then fighting games was always something that I was into fighting games, sports games, local multiplayer games. When I lived with roommates, when I had a lot of roommates now, mind you, um, Mrs. Venom obviously is a big gamer as well, but you know, uh, unfortunately she's not as big a fan of like the fighting stuff and, and the more competitive multiplayer type games. You know, if we can find a good co-op multiplayer, um, like a Call of Duty or a Borderlands, something like that, then yeah, she'll definitely jump on with me. But she's the RPG player in the house. RPG, sim stuff. Um, yeah, that's definitely more her taste. I'm more about just action. I, I-, I want a gun and a target and I'm happy. Awesome. Nice. Well, don't we all want a gun and a target and hat? That sounds very yeah. American. I'm just kidding. Then. <laughs> well, I'm yeah. just kidding. <laughs> And for the last four years, every American's had the same target. So that's that's very true. Very true. <laughs> and now you're also a park, poker player. And I don't want to skip over that because you're pretty good. I mean, I, you know, thank you. Uh, I, I, it's a dream of mine to retire from working and just play poker professionally. I'm not at the point where I can do that right now. Um, in fact, this past weekend, I've just played uh, last night and Saturday night, had great nights, both nights made, you know, a good amount of money that I'll be spending at Disneyland tomorrow. Nice. Very and, nice. Yeah. And, um, but as far as, uh, you know, when it started, I mean, I gotta, I gotta say, I I've been a poker player as far as, um, five card draw and seven card stud since I was like eight years old, my father taught me how to play five card stud and then seven card stud uh, because he went to a weekly poker game back in the day for, you know, penny stakes, like, you know, five and 10 cent hands, things like that. Um, I picked up Texas Hold'em probably when the majority of people of Americans picked up Texas Hold'em, which would have been in 2004 after Chris Moneymaker uh, won the World Series of Poker. He was one of the first amateurs to win a million dollar poker tournament, which basically... Oh, wow. It just showed people that anyone could be a champion. You know, you could beat the Michael Jordan of poker on any given day. You know, even though it is a skill based game, there's a lot of luck involved. So which is probably the biggest factor as to why I'm not a professional poker player right now. Uh, Luck is just too much of a factor. You know, I mean, yeah. I, the, the amount of stories I could tell you on just how confident you are going into a hand and then you walk away not having the rent that month. So, yeah, it's uh. It's heartbreaking and it's exhilarating all at once. But at least you can take your winnings to Disneyland. Let's celebrate the small victories, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Always celebrate the small victories. Well, thank you so much for that little intro on yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, every guest on our show is exposed to two questions from me. (laughs) The first one is, do you prefer digital or physical media for your video games? Okay, this is an interesting question because... I'm in the process of shifting my preference. Um, I've always been a fan of physical media. Um, You guys know I'm a huge horror movie fan, so I am a physical media collector for the most part. And when it came to video games, I always preferred, you know, the physical media. Now, part of the reason why was because of trade-ins. You know, I... Yep. Growing up, I wasn't exactly rich. So it's like, you know, I could play one game at a time, save up maybe half the money for a new game, trade in the old one and and jump right in. Obviously, as I've gotten older, money is less of an issue. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a software engineer currently for AT&T. So, you know, money is not as big of an issue as it used to be, though I still live in Southern California. So I do live in one of the most expensive states in the world. So uh, dispensable income isn't necessarily there. But the point is, is that with money maybe not being as much of an issue, I am starting to lean towards uh, digital purchases to the point where my uh, I actually bought my first digital console on this generation. I got the digital PS5. Wow. Oh, nice. Wow. So, yeah. So moving forward, it's going to be all digital for PlayStation. But I'm more of an Xbox guy. So, you know, I, I, I know there's always that back and forth on Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, blah, blah, blah. I try not to get into those conversations. Um, because I buy them all. And, right. you know, if, if you want to know, you know, which one is legitimately better, it's people like me that you come to people who actually own both consoles, you know, you can't go to a, uh, an Xbox fanboy and ask them, you know, which one do you think is better? We already know his answer. And he's probably going to give us the same basic, uh, you know, uh, reasoning that we've heard a 1000 times before. 
So, yeah, I, I, I just don't want to play that game of, uh, you know, mine's better. No, mine's better. I, I'd rather just buy them all, enjoy them and come up with my own opinions. Yeah, that's kind of how I am, because I eventually I will get the Xbox. Like, that's how I always do. I usually go for Sony first because that's when I might that's my favorite go to system, like mm-hmm. just because of the games. And then I go to Xbox because it's got a lot more of the multiplayer games that I really enjoy. Yeah. And then I from- like cross-platform stuff i usually go xbox because a lot of the time it just looks prettier i hear that yeah for the most part yeah i mean xbox especially this generation we're getting we're going to get a lot more games running at 120 frames so yeah that's something that i'm really looking forward to which i don't think ps5 is going to be able to do at least not at this point uh in the current generation but for me it's more about the controller believe it or not yes i tend to prefer certain controllers with certain games for example fighting games it has to be a playstation controller i can't stand the xbox controller for fighting games it's too big it's too clunky i'm not a fan of it the the classic uh sony controller and i'm not talking about the ps5 necessarily because the ps5 controller is like the closest thing to an xbox controller (laughs) sony's put out so it's kind of interesting but as far as PlayStation, you know, one through four, that controller I prefer for fighting games, for sports games, for things like that. But when it comes to first person shooters, driving games, I prefer the Xbox controller. I feel like the triggers are a little bit more uh, responsive um, than the Sony ones, at least, you know, through personal um, tests, things like that. So, yeah, for me, it's more about which controller goes with the game more. Obviously, if one if the game looks drastically better or plays drastically better on one console over the other, I'm going to get that one. But, you know, if, if they're pretty much the same, like when you're looking at, like, say, FIFA 2021, they look great on both. It looks great on both consoles. So I'm just yeah. going to go with the Sony because I like that controller better for sports games. That makes sense. I think it's a good conversation you guys are having because I really do think it comes down to preference of what game you're playing, you know, how the controller feels in your hand. Now, I don't play, I do have an Xbox and and PlayStation 5. I don't have the brand new spanking new ones, Mm -hmm. Uh, but I have used both. And I actually do prefer the Xbox controller personally, Mm -hmm. Uh, but like, it really does depend. And I agree when people get into these wars about console system, like dig the one you dig, like (laughs) that's what you like. That's what you like. I mean, you know, I I understand finances and I understand that people aren't going to be able, you know, not everybody's as lucky as I am and able to buy two $500 consoles on launch day. So, you know, I understand my privilege and I, 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 you know, I try not to flaunt it too much, but at the same time, I also, like I said, a big part of it is because I don't want to engage in those conversations. One Mm -hmm. is better than the other. Who cares? Right. If you, just like Heather said, if you enjoy one, go with it. There's no need to bash the other. If you're an Xbox fanboy, be an Xbox fanboy fanboy but there's no need to bash the playstation because of it it's just it's petty and it's stupid and it doesn't help the community at all exactly and uh one thing i do have to say is like you know i i like that there is the competition between microsoft and sony Mm because when they're competing they are trying to vie for the for each consumer so and all all in all the consumers win because we just always get like they're always fighting for our attention and our money so so it's just always a win-win And you're allowed to show your video game privilege on this show. This is like what it's about. I have to listen to Scott talk about magic every time. So you're allowed to talk about video Uh, games. Nice. Well, you and I will speak uh, separately when Scott talks about magic because, yeah, I know nothing of magic. Oh, you'll learn. Don't worry. I know all about it now. Um, So the next question is a very serious question. And it's haunted Mm. me since I was eight years old. Can you beat or have you beaten Echo the Dolphin? I have, but it was with the use of uh, a magazine. I, I believe I had a Nintendo Power that kind of guided me through. I didn't use any cheat codes necessarily, but I did use a walkthrough and I did eventually beat that stupid fucking octopus. So what happened at the end of the game? Did you did you get reunited rem- with your dolphin friends? Do you remember? I don't remember. It's been, <laughs> what, Jesus. I've only played about 13,000 games since That's then. True. So. That's true. That's yeah, true. And I'm specifically vaguely remember. asking... <laughs> about echo the dolphin mainly because i could barely get past the second level because i just get so frustrated with that game so i'm very pleased to hear that someone has done it uh cheat not even cheat codes magazine help or not mad respect yeah. venom yeah mad respect i'll still use walkthroughs periodically i mean the older i get the less i care about challenges i just yeah. want a fun game you know well, if i get to a choke point fun. 
Yeah, exactly. First and foremost, a game should be fun. And if it's if it's too challenging, if it's Dark Souls or something, then, yeah. you know, and and I understand that there's a certain market for that. I, I totally understand that there's that gamer that just wants to challenge himself and beat the hardest games in the world. And that's cool. That's awesome. But I've gone I, I'm I'm just past that at this point. I, I just want to have fun when I if, if I'm plopping down 60, 70 bucks for a game, I don't give a shit about the challenge. No. I want to have fun. And I want to enjoy my time. And if it's got some replay value, that's an added bonus as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for answering those questions. And I'll let Scott take it from here. (laughs) All right. So uh, like always, we uh, go to go through at least one or two news articles. I found one because besides like just game announcements, there really hasn't been any like big news. I I just like to kind of go for like more data and opinion pieces if I can find them. Uh, so the news piece I ended up getting uh, was actually shared to our controllers up cards down uh, Facebook page by Robert Ward. And it's uh, new Sony data reveals nearly half of PlayStation owners now are women. Uh, women gamers are on the rise and new data from Sony has confirmed just how close we are to a 50 50 split in gaming demographics. In a recent presentation to investors, the company detailed favorable statistics in which indicated 41% of PlayStation 4 and PS5 owners are women. That's compared to women making up just 18% of PlayStation 1 owners two decades ago. I just thought this was just kind of a neat little excerpt that I wanted to take out because, yeah, it's it's come to the time where, like, yeah, there are a lot more women that have invested in gaming. And I think, uh, in the, especially in the last year, I know the numbers have increased. And I think part of that has to do with the whole pandemic and using video games as an escapism. And so I think like just seeing that data shows that's like, yep, it's not just the male dominated uh, hobby that it used to be, <clears throat> though we still have the issues of the male treating women like crap or harassing them on online games, unfortunately. But- Misogyny is very strong. And right. I don't see it going away anytime soon, especially in that community, unfortunately. No, and that's the sad part. It's interesting about the video game thing, because I played video games a lot when I was younger. And I was, uh, you know, that term I was calling, I was, I was called a tomboy. I liked wrestling. I liked sports. I liked G.I. Joes. I liked Ninja Turtles, but I wore pretty dresses. I was very quote unquote feminine, but I enjoyed video games a lot. And none of my girlfriends to this day played video games for the amount that I did. I also feel like it's not just the pandemic, though. I think you make a really good point, Scott, that people are home and they have the time, um, especially yep. females who tend to do double shift as you know mothers and wives and working. There just tends to be, they take on more roles. I think it's just becoming more socially acceptable to talk oh, about. And is. there's more female-centered games. And I think we have sins to thank for a lot of that because I think that role-playing was what really attracted young women to being able to adopt a character and live out a fantasy life. And as well as uh, the Final Fantasy series, or there's another um, video game that I can't think of, World of Warcraft. I know there's a lot of female players in that too, right? So I feel like we're just beginning to, there was games that were attracted to women. And then there was also just this, oh, you, you play games too, I play games too. You know, when I found the horror community online through Venom and other great people and met other females, it was nice to talk to other females who don't think you're crazy because you like bloody stuff. Like, there's a lot of like, what's wrong with you? Why would you like that? That's not yeah. fun. That's not nice. That's violent. That's this, that's, that's that. And really, it's only been in the last couple of years that my girlfriends have really accepted what I like. Um, what about your wife, Venom? Now, Mrs. Mm-hmm. Venom plays video games. What's been her experience? Do you mind sharing or? I mean, To my knowledge, we've never really talked about our time growing up with video games, so I wouldn't really know a lot about what she played when she was younger. Like I said, when I met her, I'm not even sure how big a gamer she was when we met. Uh, Mm. Massive. uh, She's she's telling me massive. So, yeah. Uh, (laughs) Does she want to come on? She's welcome to jump on if she wants. uh, She's on her way to work right now, unfortunately. Okay. (laughs) But, uh, <laughs> yeah, in the I mean, background laughing. I love yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. But like I said, you know, Adam. what's that? On the Adam computer. The Adam computer. There oh, you go. oh, wow. Nice. Old school so she's gamer. old school. 
Oh, yeah, we're both awesome. old as hell. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I didn't mean it like that. Oh God. Um, <laughs> but has she run into anyone that's been challenging? Has she said anything to you about dealing with difficult people online? Not at all. No. I but, mean, she, she's not the biggest online multiplayer either. I mean, a majority of her games are going to be just local things that she plays on her own. I, I know uh, Star Trek Discovery's a game that she's been playing a pretty heavily we both have been playing marvel strike force together lately but you know like i said as far as what i know of her you know lots of rpgs type stuff more story driven than action driven i'm the action guy like i said um so yeah uh, as far as misogyny i'm not sure if she's really like i said since she's not really online i don't know if she's mm-hmm. really yeah she's she's shaking her head yeah, she doesn't really run it. into a lot of uh yeah misogynists online calling her out for being female and i think that only happens if the, the female's winning i feel like if they find out it's like when they get mad at some people you know get sure. mad at children for beating them too in video games. I don't know, oh, Scott, yeah. do you do you have any females like that you in your life that have experienced any of that or said anything to you? Uh, yeah, a few of the female friends that uh, I used to play online with back in the day, like they would either just get like typical sexually harassed, like either through private messages, because you, know, you can just text message somebody through the systems. And so they'd get messages from guys just being creepy that way. And then they would just get the ones that are just like, oh, you're no good at video games. You're a girl. Or like they won't, they I've known some that were actually afraid to actually use voice chat because they got treated like completely differently once they were found out that they were a woman. I um, could actually, it, it doesn't really pertain to video games, but it's still technically online. If you want to discuss it, I have had some female friends who've experienced misogyny online while playing poker. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah. A lot of my female friends will use male names and avatars because they don't want other players knowing that they're female because it's, um, it can get, I mean, with any community, it can get very toxic, but when you're talking about actual real money, exchanging hands, it yeah. gets incredibly toxic. I yeah. mean, when a male uh, poker player loses a large cash pot to a female player. Yeah. It, it, it's a good 75% chance that we're going to get some nasty comments in the chat. So, um, but like I said, most of the, most of the players that I play with that I know of that are female tend to use male avatars just to avoid all that stuff. It's a shame though. And it shouldn't yeah. be that way. And hopefully right. as we continue and, you know, we get to accountability culture and people mm. realize that they shouldn't behave certain ways, you know, and future generations coming up. But I think you're right, Ben. And when money, when big money's exchanging hands, I doubt that person would be overly polite to another man either. They're probably going to just be a Usually when it's man to man, yeah, usually when it's man to man, you'll get like a quick one or two word insult and then, Mm. you know, they tend to drop it. I have noticed, though, that when it's when it's very obviously a female, um, it'll be more than a couple of words. It'll be like a paragraph or it'll be like 10 to 50, yeah, a 10 minute tirade on the on the woman. It just doesn't make sense. And it's kind of funny, too, because on the on the back end of that. I actually also know some male poker players who use female avatars specifically to antagonize misogynists online. So, <laughs> nice. so right that, that makes me smile at least. <laughs> that is awesome. And really at the end of the day, if the female's walking away with the money, who's the winner, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's funny that your buddies will use female avatars. That sounds oh, yeah. like a good time. Well, I play with a few trolls, so yeah, it happens. Hey, trolls are entertaining sometimes when they're on the right side. Not all trolls are villains. Right? That's true. That's true. Very true. All right. So, yeah, I will just jump into uh, the video game releases. Um, So if there's any that come, like, that I mentioned that sound interesting, I'll say after I read the list, we can discuss a few of them if you want. But uh, right off the bat, there's uh, Ghost and Goblins Resurrection coming to PC, PS4, and Xbox on June 1st, uh, Necromunda Hired Gun coming to PC, PS4, PS5, and Xbox on June 1st, Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrade uh, coming to PS5 on June 10th, Ninja Gaiden The Master Collection PC, PS4, Xbox, and Switch on June 10th, Ratchet & Clank uh, Rift Apart coming out on PS5, uh, did not have a date on that one, but I think that one was also June 10th or 11th. Um, Dungeons and Dragons Dark Alliance uh, comes out on PS4, PS5, Xbox, Switch on June 22nd. 
Alex Kidd and Miracle World DX coming to PC, Xbox, PS4, PS5, and Xbox Series X uh, coming out June 24th. Legend of Mana coming to P- uh, PC, PS4, Switch on June 24th. Samurai Warriors 5 coming to PS4 and Switch on June 24th. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 coming to Nintendo Switch on June 25th. Destroy All Humans coming to Nintendo Switch on <laughs> June 29th. Mm. And Disgaea 6 Defiance of Destiny coming to Nintendo Switch on June 29th as well. And yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited for the uh, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart because it's like another PS5 exclusive that we're finally getting. So I'm just wanting to see what more of the system can do. So I, I will probably eventually get that one because I've seen some stuff for it. And it looks freaking beautiful. Yeah, I've seen a couple of videos. It looks gorgeous. It looks like a uh, it looks like a Pixar movie almost. Yeah. So, oh. yeah. I'm not That's sure if I'm going to purchase that one, but it's definitely one I'd be interested in if I can get a chance to play it. Yeah, that's kind of how I am. Like, I, I'm usually the one that'll wait because I just usually can't afford to spend like a full amount out of game. So I usually just kind of patiently wait it out for a sale. But like sometimes I just if I'm really just itching for it, I'll pay full price, mm-hmm. which seeing that I'll, I'll probably wait on reviews on that one first before I jump out and buy it day one. Um, but I did get a just because me being the Magic the Gathering nerd, I had to bring uh, one release up. Yeah, I told you, Venom. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, Scotty. I know. But uh, Magic the Gathering Modern Horizons 2 is getting released June 18th with pre-release on June 11th. So this is basically a set about uh, that's reprints of older cards from the 20-some-odd years of Magic Magic's history and their bringing them into the modern format. So that means that the, the format will actually be able to use some of these older cards they were not allowed to use before. So it's just exciting and uh, pretty much almost like buying a lotto ticket because sometimes you just buy a pack and you can get a good chunk of money just by trading those cards in. That's cool. Mm-hmm. That's cool. That's awesome. I have uh, I have a friend out here who co-owns a like comic slash card store. And yeah, he deals in the resale market for Magic cards and Funko Pops. Actually, he's uh, he's kind of my source for for the hard to find Funkos because I also oh, nice. collect Funkos. So yeah, um, but yeah, um, he talks about opening opening a box because he'll always order double of everything. He'll get a case for the store, but then he'll tend to get a case for him and his friends as well. And they'll literally have a party where they won't actually play the game. It'll it'll literally be an, a pack open a box opening party. Everybody just nice. open up, a, you know, he hands everybody a bunch of packs. Everybody opens them up. You know, they, uh, they start valuing everything. And yeah, he's, he's told, he's told me stories of buying boxes of cards for maybe 500 and then like pulling out a $5,000 card out of it, you know, yeah. like, you know, some kind of ridiculous limited edition. I know nothing about this stuff. So I sure, I'm sure I'm not using the proper terminology, but yeah. Um, just, you know, uh, hearing those stories especially as a poker player i, I just see cha-ching and yeah yep. <laughs> <laughs> makes me want to kind of invest but yeah i invest in so many other things uh, you know I-, I can't spread myself too thin yeah i don't blame you and that is why like in my background you just see stacks of cards because mm-hmm. my addiction runs rampant i'll just run to a store and be like i'll grab a couple packs i already own a bunch from this set but screw it maybe there'll be a chance that i open that 50 dollars card that i wanted and then I can just turn either I keep it or turn around and sell it, depending on what the card is. Like I just opened a two hundred dollar card a few weeks back, and I was going, Ooh. "I'm not going to play this card in any of my decks, so I'm just going to go around throw it right on eBay, and made one hundred fifty bucks." Very nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, That's I awesome like doing study. that. Um, cool. But uh, then uh, we'll wait till next month. But next month I got a really exciting nerd out magic moment that I'll be talking about because <laughs> the new set will be coming. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, I do have a. Uh, some board games starting Kickstarter crowdfunding this month that I want to just bring up real fast. Uh, Fall of the Mountain King, which is a two to five player game, is going to be on Kickstarter on June 1st. Alien Pet Shop is a two to four player game, also on June 1st. My Singing Monsters is a two to five player game on June 1st. Lonely Undead is a one to four player game coming out on June 7th. Overstocked, June 8th. Skeptics, another one to four player game coming June 8th. And Aracon Wars is a two to four player game coming out June 8th as well. Uh, so, yeah, if you guys are interested in any of this, uh, they should be available on Kickstarter within about a week or so of hearing this episode. Awesome. Cool. Uh, and then, yeah, that is it for the releases and the news and intros. So we will kick it over to Pow, Pow, Pow for Retro Roundtable. 
<laughs> Welcome to the Retro Roundtable and another very exciting episode of Video and Arcade Top 10. Um, our lovely guest is a friend of mine. He was actually one of my first podcasting friends, so I'm so happy he's here today. Um, but he messaged me to be like, this is really 90s, huh? And I'm like, oh yeah, dude, like this shit was like <laughs> I think, lit I think pain, in Canada. Painfully 90s was the like, whole of my years, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I rushed home many a days as a young Heather from the school bus to catch Video and Arcade Top 20 because I uh, wanted to learn how to beat all the games. So this is labeled episode one four one or 14, sorry, 416. And they had a lot of issues with this one when they uploaded it to YouTube. I'm sure you guys yeah, saw. I, I thought it was at first it was like rights issues because it kind of cut out like right when yeah. the song came on, mm-hmm. but then they played it anyways. I'm going, okay, I don't know what happened. Uh, it was there. just, a, it, you know, this is an episode that came out probably I'm guesstimating from, it's hard to track the exact date, but this probably would have been around November, 2000. So we're yeah. going back 21 years. <laughs> Oh, you know, here we are today. So the first game was Excite Bike 64. And I'm going to be honest, I'm pretty upset that I don't have an N64 right now because I would go on a bike, Excite Bike. Have either <laughs> one of you played this game before? Yeah. Uh, um, I have not. Oh, Venom, yeah, then let's uh, hear I, your I, adventures. I, I was a big fan of the original back on the back in the Nintendo days. It was just a 2D side scroller. Um, it wasn't so much a racing game. At least it didn't feel like one. It wasn't. It didn't feel like a traditional one because of all the obstacles and everything else. Um, but then with the 64 version, it started to feel more like a traditional racer. It didn't have as many obstacles. They actually started to add more real world tracks, like moto tracks. Mm. I don't know if you guys watch MX racing or any of oh, that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Indoor indoor dirt bikes, you know that stuff. That's kind of where Excite Bike went during the 64 years, which isn't really necessarily a complaint. I wish they would have put some kind of mini game in there, a 2D mini game that kind of harkened back to the original, because I love the original. Um, 64, I remember enjoying it, but it I remember not playing it for very long either. Fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. unfortunately for me, like uh this is the era that I've because we've started to notice that uh video and arcade top 10 seem to be sponsored and focused mainly on Nintendo. Nintendo. And <laughs> N64 is the generation I did not get a chance to play much of. Mm. Um, and we was, do get to I, PlayStation later episodes of, of Video Arcade, but yeah, oh, okay. it's, it's oh, N64 yeah. for a lot. Sorry, Venom, you were going to say something. Uh, six, uh, the Nintendo 64 generation was a generation that I was very excited for. That was the first generation... Um, that happened after uh, Miss Venom and myself started dating back in, oh, nice. in 95, 96. And uh, yeah, the Nintendo 64 was the first console to come out after we got together and we, we bought one together. And yeah, we played the hell out of Mario 64. Just seeing these games in 3D for the first time, because you got the, uh, you know, you got the simulated 3D on like, you know, the Super Nintendo Generation 3 and 4. But then, yeah, when you got that Nintendo 64 and you see big fat Mario actually look like a big fat Italian, it was spectacular. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we played the hell out of that game. Um, I remember Doom 64 was another one that we played just relentlessly. Um, the Star Wars game. What was that? Um, Shad, Shad? No. It was the one with Mace Windu as the main character i can't remember i want to say shadow of the empire but i might be wrong but anyway that was the first like 3d star wars game that just completely blew our minds at the time absolutely adored it hearing a video game that had the sound effect straight from the lucas films was it was just huge because you know we had been used to super star wars super empire super return of the jedi which are in in and of themselves are spectacular games but they didn't borrow the sound effects from the films because obviously they're dealing with the limitation of the consoles at the time so once they got to nintendo 64 and they could actually do audio samples to actually i mean you guys got to realize i'm a gigantic star wars nerd it's one of the things that brought my <laughs> wife and i together was our love of nice. Star Wars. Aww. and uh, yeah so when i when i've played a video game that actually had the sound effects directly from the movie uh my nerd boner was epic <laughs> it's huge it's huge oh monstrous yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, I love N64. Now, I would have been maybe one Mm -hmm. or two years younger than you, Venom, when I was playing N64. Um, But it was a big deal when it came out. Like, we would spend many, uh, this tells you the age difference, sleepovers playing (laughs) N64. And I wish I had a psych bike, man. I would have played the shit out of this game. Uh, The Pokemon Puzzle League looked 
like Tetris. Yeah, like um, Tetris and Dr. Mario had a baby. Right? I, I've never played that. Did either one of you play that? Nope. No, I think I, pay, I played Pokemon Snap, but I don't believe I played the one you mentioned now. And then we had a little music video from a little known group, NSYNC. Who are um, <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, super cute to see them all like popping around and stuff. And and then we had Banjo Tooie, which I didn't realize how many games Banjo Tooie was in since we started doing this. Every every episode of Video Arcade, there's been a Banjo Tooie game. Yeah. Like how many Banjo Tooie games are out there? Yeah, I'm not even sure on how many sequels. I only there played are. the original Banjo Kazooie. I, I I never played any after that. Yeah, crazy. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think the only one only episode that we did, like I think our very first episode was the only controllers up that did not have a Banjo Kazooie. Yeah, like <laughs> it seems to be like the shit. Or anyway, it's what this you know TV show got the rights to to play, and right. then finally Mario Party Two, which yeah. I never really was a big Mario Party fan. I don't know how you guys felt. Like um, I was for the GameCube and the uh, I think it was the Nintendo Wii also had one as well. And like me and my buddies uh, would get together and drink and smoke down and just play these games just for kind of just so- doing something socially. Mm-hmm. I was a huge player of the Mario Party games. Mario Party and Mario Kart were absolute must haves in my house, uh, you know, for whatever the current Nintendo console was. So, yeah. Mario Kart 64 came out. I think I might have gone to a midnight release for that one, if I remember oh, correctly, nice. just because they were giving stuff away. Um, but yeah, Mario, uh, specifically Mario Party 2, I remember playing a lot with my wife because, like I said, that was our first console together. And it might have been the first multiplayer game that we had bought at the time. I'm not sure if we had played. I don't think I played the original Mario Party with her. Um, but yeah, two, we had a blast. And it's kind of funny as I was watching that episode that Heather sent to me, I, I'm just yelling at the kids on screen. I'm like, you guys are terrible. How did you not how did you not score there? I just and oh. they're terrified too because they get pulled from the studio audience to play and Those they're all like shitting kids. themselves, right? Yeah, well, I, I could not get over how every single one of them had that deer in the headlights look. Yes. It's like, like, oh my god, that's a camera. What do I do? <laughs> Yeah, like, oh my God, that's a camera. And these tall dudes that I don't really know are just like grabbing me going, yeah, we're going to be excited because we're from the 90s. Yeah. I did actually yeah. notice that, how touchy the hosts on that, on that show Super are. Touchy. They've got their hands all over those kids. Let's that's how we are in Canada. Up. We're just super touchy in Canada. We just touch each other well, all the time. Well, then I got to get up to Canada. You got to right? get up to Canada. I'll just be like, Venom, 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 touch, 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 touch the entire time you're here. So, yes. you know, we have N64 to thank for video and arcade top 10 and also for bringing Mr. and Mrs. Venom together because that that brought you guys <laughs> as a couple. Did you play Goldeneye as well? Oh, we love Goldeneye. Oh, yes. That was like, uh, that was the one N64 game I could say I played the shit out of. Uh, Perfect Dark was another big one. Um, 64 was probably the generation where I really started getting into first person shooters. Yeah. I already mentioned Doom 64. That was monstrous. Perfect Dark. GoldenEye. GoldenEye was almost all multiplayer for me. Like I played yeah. through the campaign once, but then that was it. It was just me and my wife shooting each other with golden guns constantly. It was pretty <laughs> awesome. It was a and that game. and that pretty much started because because if you if you asked me right now what my favorite genre is, I would say first person shooter. Um, I don't think that there's actually a first person shooter in my top 10 favorite games of all time, but I do absolutely love shooters over the last 15 to 20 years. You know, uh, Halo changed the game for me when the original oh, yeah. Xbox came out yeah. and then Halo. I mean, forget about it. My roommate and I, again, we lost an entire day playing that game. It was just amazing. Same. I've done the same thing. <laughs> exactly. Outside of a good game, right? Absolutely. So, uh, so thank you for joining us for video and arcade top 10 retro table and taking a trip back to the, to the late 90s, early 2000s. And I'll pass it back over to Scotty. All right. So for our final segment of the day, we are going to just do a round robin of what we've been playing Uh so I will pass it over to Mr. Venom, our guest. What did you? What have you brought to the table today? Well, as I've already mentioned, that Resident Evil is probably my favorite franchise ever for incredibly obvious reasons. Uh, I'm obviously going to bring Resident Evil Eight to the table. I have I, I beat it last night for the third time. I finally oh, wow. beat it. I beat it on that Village of Shadows difficulty, which is ridiculous. It's basically one hit, you're dead. Oh. Um, 
But overall, the game, okay, I absolutely adore Resident Evil 8. I know a lot of people are saying that it's not quite as good as 7. I, I will say this. I will say that Resident Evil 7 is scarier than Resident Evil 8. The set pieces are much more set in a horror universe. Um, whereas Resident Evil 8 is much more action based. There's not as okay. much survival horror. It's a lot more run and gun, which is more my speed, which obviously speaks to why I enjoy this one a lot more. Um, also, I find the villains more compelling in this one. I find the four lords um, of uh, Mother Miranda just to be a little bit more interesting than the family from Louisiana and Resident Evil 7. Not to take anything away from Resident Evil 7. It's a stellar game. It, for the second time, they redefined what Resident Evil is. How many, how many video game franchises can you name that have drastically changed their MO three times and all three times they hit a fucking home run? I mean, that's... Yeah. Amazing. Like I, so I would say the only one I know that could change it, that changed the demo constantly was Final Fantasy. And a lot of the time yeah. that did not successfully hit. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I remember yeah, my wife, uh, like I said, my wife's the RPG player. When that first uh, online multiplayer Final Fantasy came out, she was so excited. And I'd say within 40 minutes, the excitement was gone. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> I can't stand this. This isn't Final Fantasy. <laughs> Just, yeah. Uh, so I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, a lot of franchises will make changes that don't quite work, but Resident Evil has done it three times and nailed it all. Well, twice, at least they redefine themselves. Obviously the original game, if anybody's never played a Resident Evil game and you go back to the original, you're going to hate it. I mean, right. the tank controls, the, st the stationary camera, it's not a good modern horror, you know, video game. Um, but obviously if you played it at the time, it was revolutionary. I still have nightmares of those dogs jumping through the <laughs> yes. goddamn window. So yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, back to resident evil eight. Um, I absolutely love the story, love the, the whole story structure with the four Lords leading to mother Miranda. I love the setting. It's got that vaguely European, almost Romanian type setting, which I, I think they actually do mention Romania in the game a couple of times. And actually I looked it up, um, the, not the main villain in the game, but the main villain that's been in the commercials, Lady Demetresque. Oh, yeah. Um, she act That is actually a Romanian name. I actually looked it up. It, it's legitimately a Romanian name, and it is tied uh, to the Draculs, uh, believe oh, it or nice. not. So, wow. so there's actually some history there, which I, I thought was kind of cool. Um, so then again, that kind of adds a, a, that little touch of based on a true story for me, which obviously it's not based on a true story. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm exaggerating, but, you know, that element does help me. Um, like I said, the fact that the game is more action oriented, the, the, the action set pieces, I am absolutely in love with the Heisenberg boss fight. Um, the, the Heisenberg, uh, Heisenberg is the final boss, uh, the final Lord that you fight before you go to fight Mother Miranda. And that fight, it, they basically, it's, it's a whole nother game. It, you know, it, it, you're not on your feet, you're in a vehicle. Hopefully this isn't spoiler warnings for a spoiler for anybody, but um, it's just, it's something that I hadn't seen much of. Not to say that there's not vehicle stuff in any past Resident Evils, but the way that they did this, where it's actually a dog fight, ugh, absolutely loved it. Actually played it like three or four times in a row before continuing to Mother Miranda because I had so much fun <laughs> with it. Um, I think the voice acting is stellar. Uh, this voice acting, just like Seven. Again, Seven had great voice acting. This one just continues the tradition. Um, and then it comes down, and the only complaint I might have is there's a reveal, which I'm not going to talk about here because it's a major spoiler. Uh, there's a reveal with Ethan Winters that it's a, it, 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 it's a little hard to swallow. Let's just leave it at that. Oh, okay. Um, there's a reveal at the end where you're just like, wait, really? That, I, I mean, I guess it explains some things that occur in the game, like, you know, how he's able to take so much damage and not go down, blah, blah, blah. But it just, I, I had, a, I had some issues with it, um. And then uh, what was the other issue? Damn it. I remember I only had two issues with it and it was one was the end. And damn it. I can't think of what the other one was. Sorry. <laughs> if I think oh, of it, I'll let you know. But yeah, ultimately the game is stellar. I absolutely love it. Not the best Resident Evil game by any stretch. You can make arguments for Resident Evil 1 HD. You can make arguments for Resident Evil 4. You can make arguments for Resident Evil 8. But I'm still going to put this in the top five for the franchise. And that's a franchise that consists of 23 games. So top five isn't bad. Yeah, that's um, pretty good. I, 
I do wish the game was a little longer. I beat I beat it the first time in about twelve hours, and that's with exploring. Oh wow! Um, I I've been told that the critical path is like eight to ten hours, but with exploring, I did it in twelve. So you know, a, a little bit more content maybe would have helped. But ultimately, what's in there is stellar. So it, you're getting your sixty bucks worth. Uh, I'll tell you that. And like I said, I finished it three times already. I will be going back for the fourth. <laughs> nice. Yeah. This is one of those games because it's like a, it's one of those franchises that I love and hate at the same time. Because like once part four or part five and six came out, I was like completely, completely turned off by it. But then part seven came out and I got maybe one third of the way through the game and just said, I can't do this anymore. This game is giving me freaking heart palpitations. I'm sweating. <laughs> I am too fucking scared. I can't like and it's weird because, you know, we're all horror movie lovers. But when you're in a horror movie video game. Like it just gets so damn intense and I become just like this big wuss that jumps at everything. So it's like I I had to put that game down and never went back to it because it freaked me out so damn bad. So I, uh, I think it, the first person perspective really like gets yeah. me like in those games. And that's why I was like was skeptical of part eight. I'm like, I haven't bought it yet, but I do love what I'm hearing about it. So I, it's something yeah. I will eventually get. I mean, if it's if it was legitimately fear that was keeping you from finishing seven, I don't think that'll be an issue with eight. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's still scary set pieces. Don't get me wrong. There's still tense moments. There's one specific moment where you're hiding from an unbeatable boss, uh, blah, 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 um, which can get pretty intense when you, when you do it the first time and you don't know that you're supposed to hide. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think you would enjoy this one a little bit more because it's not nearly as intense uh, from a horror standpoint. I mean, I look at Resident Evil 7 and 8 the way I look at Alien and Aliens, you know, oh, it gotcha. went from okay. a horror movie to an action movie. That's how I feel Resident Evil 7 and 8's uh, progression has gone too. Resident okay. Evil 8 is so much more action based that I don't think it's nearly as scary, which is probably why people tend to say Resident Evil 7 is quote unquote better. Um, yeah. I won't argue with people who say that because I understand why they're saying it. The characters look amazing. The, the, the lighting in Resident Evil 7, it, it adds to the tension just in, in a masterful way. Um, but yeah, I, I think you'd like 8, Scott. Way more action-oriented, less jump scares, you know, crap like that. Um, yeah, and, and the lichens are fun to kill. <laughs> nice, yeah. Awesome. I was like, I think you might have sold me on it. I'll have to pick this one up for sure then. Yeah, give it a shot. And uh, Heather, how about you? What did you bring to the table today? Well, just before we leave horror movies, if uh, you like how Benham reviewed that video game, which is, uh -huh. he reviews things so well. Like, I swear, Benham, I envisioned myself in the video game while you were talking about it. You guys need to listen <laughs> to Fresh Cuts and No More Room in Hell because you will definitely enjoy hearing this man's walkthrough through films. Thank but you. the game I brought to the table is not nearly as interesting, but it's a party game. And it's called What the Dub. And it is a game that you can buy off PlayStation. It's $10.99 Canadian. So that must mean it's like $2 American. <laughs> um, it can play, well, it's probably $5.99 American. It can play one to 12 players. And basically all it is, is it's taken old movies, old PSAs that are black and white, and they play a part of it and then you dub it. So oh, that sounds so fun. So player has an opportunity to dub. So when I was playing it, so my friends purchased this game because we have games night. They're like, oh my God, Heather's going to love this game. So they waited to play it till I came over. And of course, the night we played it, it was all horror movies that came up. So it was Night of the Living Dead, House huh. on Haunted Hill. I'm like, oh yeah, House on Haunted Hill. They're like, how the fuck did you know that, right? Because they're not, like most people will know Night of the Living Dead. And there was, a, I think Invisible Man was on there. Like it was just, I was like, oh yeah. That's what that is, right? And it's a, it's a lot of fun. And then the dub is read for the scene. So everybody's dub that goes in is presented in the scenes. And then you vote to who had the best dub. So it's a great party game. It's really inexpensive. So if you sometimes you have people over, especially as the pandemic is ending. Maybe people are feeling a little awkward. Or maybe you're just looking there for something to do to kind of kill the time and get conversation started. This is a great little party game. All you need to play is your phone. It's simple to log into. And you can obviously make it as offensive or as family friendly as you want it to be. 
depending on what you want to do. We played a couple of rounds and it probably was about, I think we played two rounds and it went for about an hour, which is perfect, right? Like for some people for a party game, that's a perfect amount of time. So you can buy it on PlayStation 2. It is also available through streaming and also Nintendo Switch. Nice. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. I, I would totally be down to do something like that as a party game. Absolutely. It, it is, right? Like, especially if you're having people over that don't play a lot of video games. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's like perfect. Right? Or, you're, or you want to do a board game type thing, but you don't have a board game set up. It's a great, it's a great substitute. Yeah, I was saying kind of like a good icebreaker, too. Um, but yeah, I guess I will uh, jump to the game that I brought to the table. This one, I kind of started playing it when we were recording last time, but I didn't have a lot of uh, hands-on time with it, so I wanted to wait. Uh, and that is uh, a game on the PC called Valheim. And it is a Norse mythology survival game where you are pretty much a lost spirit trying to find his way to Valhalla. And to get to Valhalla, like they're dropping you in this basically mythical world and you are literally running around in your underwear having to start from nothing. So you got to build your own tools. Then once you get your tools, you can start building benches workbenches and once you build a workbench you can start building a home and like gotta then you can get like actual weapons to go hunt monsters and get skins to make yourself armor and it's the typical survival style where it's like you know i got you got to make sure to eat and all that but uh the one thing i liked about this where i do not like in a lot of survival games is the fact that oh if you are playing this game and you forget to eat or you forget to drink you die in this game your life starts at like 20 hit points. And if you eat, it boosts your life. But then as like you start getting hungry again, it will drop back down to 20 hit points. So you just become a lot weaker and someone can kill you easier in one shot. It's Which, like Oregon Trail and steroids. It kind of is. <laughs> like, hold my beer, Oregon Trail. We're going to show you how this shit really goes down. And it's fun because uh, like you can play it obviously on uh, multiplayer. So if anybody's familiar with Ark, that one you can build, play with like a ton of people each person's server that you like so you can make a dedicated server and jump into it any server that you go into it's going to be completely different style map compared to what the other one is so it's always a new regenerated world and when i started playing it i played it with my group of magic players and like we were just kind of wandering around just kind of learning the basics and all that then i logged off and then a week and a half goes by i come back on and there's this massive fortress and all these trophies of all these giant beasts that were killed. I'm going, the hell did I miss? So I was like, mm-hmm. all right, screw this. I am starting my own game with my own character, like a new character. My roommate or my our co-host Tim bought it, and he also jumped in the same server as me. And so now him and I have been playing from the beginning and because I feel like I missed too much. So now we're like starting from scratch and actually learning the steps by steps. But like, if you are a fan of survival games and a fan of like just like Norse mythology, I recommend this one because it's just really fun um, and just it's a freaking huge, huge world, um, and like so many different monsters. Like you start off with like these little things called Graylings, like that are like your mythical creature, and then you fight gods that are like the god of the deer, Ichthyor, and god of thunder thor is flying through the skies you can see him in like way in the distance and lightning crackling around him and like trolls and mammoths and it's just like total fantasy nerddom and i freaking love it and i just love the whole like just pretty much starting from nothing and building a character and building him with armor and all that stuff it just it's just something that i can see i will be investing a lot of time in <laughs> awesome uh, but yeah, I think it's like on Steam for like nine ninety nine, so it's dirt cheap. And I think it's still in, uh, I think it's still kind of in beta mode. So it's like constantly getting updated and up. And so like you're just basically in the beginning of this game as it's being made. And they're fixing things and making new things and adding new things constantly to it. Awesome. Very nice. Yep. So that is, uh, I guess that would be the end of our uh, episode of Controllers Up, Cards Down. Heather. Oh. I would, uh, Heather, take it away. Heather, take it away. Scott's like, I don't know what to do anymore. Heather, you take this over. (laughs) Why don't we let Venom, I know I talked about his shows at the beginning, but like he could have more. I don't really know if there's more shows or not. So we're going to pass this to Venom so he can tell you where he can be found. 
Okay, well, as uh, Heather mentioned, my main show is No More Room in Hell that I do with uh, Mike Merriman and Derek B. Uh, that is a bi-monthly podcast where we try to do more obscure horror than, you know, the traditional franchises that, you know, have been reviewed to death. Our latest episode, we looked at the uh, um, uh, inmate executed an electric chair to come back stronger than ever subgenre. Ooh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. So of, of course we looked at Shocker and then we also paired it with 1988's uh, Destroyer starring Lyle Alzado, wow. which is a very under talked about movie, which uh, surprise, surprise, ended up getting way more positive reviews than Shocker, which was a little bit of a, well, it was no pun intended. It was a shocker to me. <laughs> uh, you know, Wes Craven, you know, is, uh, you know, a, an absolute master of the craft. And obviously Shocker is not necessarily the high point of Wes Craven's filmography yeah. by no. any stretch. Yeah. But I remember it being a really fun, silly movie when I saw it in the theaters back in the 80s. And then, um, or whenever it came out, maybe 90, 91. Anyway, um, watching it this time wow wow what a difference um and destroyer <laughs> you know the destroyer was a first time watch for me and we ended up really enjoying that but either way check out the episode uh we also have other segments on the show we have a, a burning question every episode um and that's usually where mike and i end up arguing about something so yeah if you want to hear me <laughs> get loud with my co-host by all means uh, check out no more room in hell uh and then we also have the sister podcast no more room in hell called fresh cuts which is a weekly podcast where we look at the newest uh, releases in the horror genre. Our latest episode that's available now, we talk about Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead, but our next episode, of course, will be A Quiet Place Part 2. So oh, yeah. check that out. Um, yeah, we all finally were able to check that out in theaters uh, this nice. weekend after, what, waiting about a year and a half for that damn movie to get yeah. released. Yeah. Right? And you know what? After seeing it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little mini review right now. After Ooh. seeing it in the theater, I understand why they did not release it on streaming. It is an absolute theater experience. It must yes. be seen in a theater. I was so, so hoping check you would out. say that. <laughs> I'm going yeah. to I'm gonna leave the rest of my review to the show. So check that out on the next episode of Fresh Cuts. And then the third show that I do with Mr. Merriman, who seems to be my life partner in podcasting <laughs> for some it's reason. It's nice you guys are life partners. I, I, yeah, go figure. Life, life frenemies, I guess, would be the <laughs> best way to put it. Um, our third podcast together is called Theme Warriors, which is a general cinematic uh, theme podcast where we basically pick a theme and then the four hosts will pick a movie that kind of coincides with that theme. So the, our latest episode that's available now is um, films that have never really received a DVD or Blu-ray release in North America. So we oh, pull out nice. some we, we, we pull out a few obscure films here and there. Like I said, that show is not horror specific. It is just general cinema. So, you know, you'll have anything from Citizen Kane to, you know, The Nutty Professor, whatever the case may be in that one. Uh, though we did review uh, two horror movies on this last episode because it's so much easier to find horror movies that haven't been released on physical yeah. media, you know, because there were so many in the 80s. They came out like every two hours. So, yeah, there's right. plenty to pick from <laughs> right. in that genre. Um, all three of those podcasts are available on the Dark Discussions Podcast Network. Um, then I have two other podcasts that are unfortunately on extended hiatuses right now for various reasons. Uh, the first one, uh, which Heather mentioned, was It's Not, uh, excuse me, In the Mic of Madness with the lovely Miss Rebecca Reinhardt and um, uh, Brad Thornton uh, from the Coffin Grounds Group. Um, that one, unfortunately, is on a hiatus uh, while Rebecca works on all her independent film projects. Um, you know, uh, Rebecca is probably the most active person in independent horror that I know. She's yeah. producing, directing. Uh, she's doing makeup. She's fucking catering, for God's sakes. I mean, she's, <laughs> what does she's Rebecca a jack of not do? Right. Exactly. That's really the question. I mean, what does she right? not do? And and um, so obviously, while she's working on her latest film, her her most recent one just came out. Uh, I'll give a shameless plug, of course. It's called The Embalmers. So um, that one, I don't know if it's available on physical release yet, but I'm sure if you hit up Rebecca on Facebook, you know, she'll give you the deets. Um, and then she's working on her latest film called Tin Roof, which I know very little about. 
Um, anybody who listens to my shows knows that I don't watch trailers. I don't read yep. synopses. I don't, I want to know apps. I don't, I barely want to know the title of the movie before I watch <laughs> it. I want to be as blind as possible. All you need to do is tell me it's a horror movie. I'm going to sit down and watch it. So, um, and because of that, I don't really have a whole lot of information on Tin Roof on our latest film, but again, there is a Facebook page. So go ahead and check that out. That is of course in the mic of madness with Rebecca and Brad, um, underwater Kaiju from outer space is my kaiju podcast that i do with jerry herring from kill the cast uh once again derek b from uh cinema attack and donna nelly formerly of the horror mafia podcast currently with uh graveyard shit which is a weird name for a podcast but whatever (laughs) (laughs) to each his own um that one unfortunately is also on an extended hiatus um jerry herring had some life issues recently uh he had to move and you know blah 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 so scheduling four podcasters in different parts of the country as you guys know is never an easy Mm -hmm. task especially when one or two of them are going through some difficulties in life so um those two podcasts are on hiatus for now and then last but not least, as far as the active shows, of course, with uh, my two lovely hosts this evening, It's Not Horror OK, our movie commentary podcast, where we barely talk about the movie, really. Yeah, so. pretty much. <laughs> Never. Never. Um, it's always the last podcast I mention, because I'm like, it's not really a podcast. <laughs> like, you want to hear it's like, well, say it's shit really for like commentary. an hour and a half, right? <laughs> You know, it's funny because when I first joined the show, I actually, as I do for all my shows, I prepared, I had facts, I tried to have like little funny factoids. <laughs> and once we were five minutes in the in the very first episode I was on, I'm like, oh, okay, this is this kind of commentary. Okay. So I basically threw my notes away and we just started making <laughs> dick and fart jokes and you know, oh man. And that's carried us through almost what a year or two now. A year and a point. half. <laughs> yeah, right. about a year and a half. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, all of the podcasts that I mentioned are available on the Dark Discussions Podcast Network, except for Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. That is available on the Legion Podcast Network. And if you're looking for that show and speci- uh, specifically, uh, look for the Kill the Cast feed. We are part of the Kill the Cast feed, which you guys are also part of that. So. Yes, we are. We're, we're a big old kill the cast family. <laughs> that is, that is so true. Jerry just kind of wrapped us all into one giant burrito. <laughs> yeah, and then he took a vacation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he was like, all right, guys, you got this shit. Um, well, thank you so much, Venom, for being here. I, I mentioned it before, but you truly are one of my favorite podcasters. The first time I podcast, you reached out to me afterwards and you were so kind. And I was terrified and I did terrify her and I was terrified doing that episode. (laughs) And I've always appreciated your feedback. I've always really respected the way you handle yourself on podcasting and off podcasting. So it was a true pleasure to have you on the show this evening. Thank you very much, guys. Um, Yeah. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a podcast whore. So yeah, I am here. (laughs) We knew you would put out too. Oh God. Oh, I'm so, I'm so easy. It's ridiculous. Absolutely. And and the funny thing is, (laughs) Heather is now compared to you as the female version of I've heard podcast. that. Which I take I, a pretty actually, big compliment. To I honest. heard that the first time a month ago, and I wasn't sure how to take it because I'm like, Heather has a giant penis? What? <laughs> oh, I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> you better believe it. Um, and we are, of course, part of the Legion Podcast Network as I yes. am shamelessly promoting us. Uh, you can find Scott and I on Friday Nightmares, as well as we have Patreon specials that we do. So maybe Venom will join us one day for one of our Patreon specials. We do lists. Uh, we do top five lists. We recently did top five uncomfortable horror films. Scott had a real feel good day of watching three of them back Ooh. to back to back. <laughs> a little bit of Solo, a little bit of Megan is Missing, a little bit of what was the other one? Uh, girl, uh, the girl next door. Yeah, just oh. sprinkle on a little Razzle Dazzle on top. So uh, <laughs> if you would like to hear that, you do have to be a Patreon member. We will eventually read it, re- release it to our regular feed, but eventually we will not. So please join <laughs> Patreon. And I think that's it, Scotty. Anything you want to add before I power us down? Uh, nope. I was like, just uh, yep. follow us on Legion. Uh, yeah, obviously, we are also proud members of the Legion Podcast Network. You can find us at the Controllers Up, Cards Down, All-Star Gaming Podcast. Uh, we have our own feed for this one. Uh, also, check us out on our Facebook page, Controllers Up, Cards Down, All-Star Gaming Podcast, where it's just all inclusive, talking about all types of games, news, silly memes about games, whatever. It's just a big, just a happy family uh, 
and yep, anyone's welcome to join and we'd love to have you. And thanks for sharing awesome. your articles um, and your thoughts. We really do appreciate it. So till next time, controllers down, cards up, power off, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.